A.W. Tozer once said, God purposed redemption in Christ Jesus before the world began, and his plan does not need any editing by man. There's a basic belief by most Christians that the ultimate state for mankind to exist in would be perfect innocence. In other words, we wish that Adam had never done what he did in the garden because the greatest status mankind could ever achieve before God would be that we were perfectly innocent by our own doing or our own choosing. Yet what we fail to realize when we think that way is that redeemed man is actually greater than innocent man. Redeemed man is greater than innocent man, because what we gain in Jesus Christ is far more than anything we've ever lost in Adam. You understand, God's ultimate state for mankind to exist in is one of redemption, not innocence. I'm not saying God wanted us to sin. I'm saying that before he ever created the earth or any of us, he knew that he was going to create us and he knew that we were going to sin. And yet knowing that we would sin before he created any of this or any of us, he chose to create all of this and all of us anyway. Think about that for a minute. Because he's God. He's all perfect, all powerful, and able to create an infinite number of versions of this world. And yet he chose to create the one that we're living in, the one where people willfully sin. Why? Because God is far more glorified by what Jesus did on the cross than he would ever be by anything we could ever do, even had we all lived perfect lives. The fact is... There is no perfect life you could ever live that could ever come close to bringing as much glory to God as the life that Jesus lived, the one that required him to shed his own blood on the cross because of our sin. In fact, if every human being on earth who has ever lived and ever will live, if every one of us lived a perfectly innocent life, all of our lifetimes combined would not bring as much glory to God as Jesus' sacrifice on the cross that paid for our sin. This is what Paul was explaining when he said, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Listen to this part. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 1 through 4. Okay, let's not miss this here. God's eternal plan from the beginning from before the creation of the world, was to allow sin and its destruction to happen in order to do a greater work of making all things new through Christ in order that God would be most glorified through the sacrifice of Jesus and the redemption that sacrifice has provided for you and me. If you believe that was not God's plan, it just, it just happened that way, well then you don't believe that God is sovereign. Because again, he could have created uh, any world in any number of ways that he wanted to, right? He could have created a world in which people never sin. And if that was the best possible world that could ever exist, then why didn't he create that world? But he didn't. No, instead he created a world in which human beings could choose between good and evil, knowing they were going to choose evil. Why would he do that? Because it was most glorifying to God for fallen man to be rescued, redeemed by God and for God. And so he created a perfect world in the beginning of time that he will remake into an incorruptible world at the end of time. While in between providing for us, as Eric Stapp says, something even an unbroken existence in the very courts of heaven couldn't do. A chance to be rescued and wooed by the rescuer because of his sacrifice, we have a value and relationship even beyond an untarnished one. The story of redemption is what will bring God the most glory. Now listen, I'm not talking about, uh, I'm not saying that God's desire 
is for some people to never have the opportunity for salvation. No, the Bible clearly states that God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2.4. So look, God's not delusional, right? He wouldn't desire something that was impossible for him to offer people by his own design. No, I'm saying every single human being has the ability to accept or reject Christ just the same, and yet knowing that not all people would accept him before he ever created this earth, he created a plan to redeem those who would. According to the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 1.12, our salvation is something that angels long to understand because even though they're constantly in the presence of God and enveloped in the glory of God, redemption by God is something they can never experience because Jesus didn't die on the cross to redeem fallen angels, which is pointed out, by the way, in Hebrews 2.16. They cannot be redeemed. No, he died to redeem fallen man. His plan from before the creation of the earth. And so although he will one day remake this earth, once again free from sin and suffering, as we'll see as we continue to working our way through uh, the book of Revelation today, until then, our lives are meant to glorify him in spite of the sin and suffering we continue to experience in this world. And uh, here's what's really mind-blowing about all of this. The fact that not only will he make all things that have been corrupted new at the end of this age, but the fact that we Christians are already made new now. Even as we continue to have to walk through the very effects of sin and suffering that have corrupted this age. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Not he will be. Not he's going to be. He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Okay, look, positionally, everything except our flesh changed at salvation. And of course, although we aren't supposed to live in the flesh as Christians, we still choose to at times because our flesh has yet to be remade like the rest of us. More on that later. So first of all, God delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, Colossians 1, 13. So now we are no longer in the flesh. Now we are in the spirit and we are in Christ. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him, Romans 8, 9. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, Paul equates the concept of being in the flesh with being in Adam. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, right? So in Adam you have the old man, in Christ you have the new man. In Adam you have a sin nature, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. In Christ you are a partaker in the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4. In Adam you're in the flesh, Romans 8, 8. In Christ you're in the spirit, Romans 8, 9. And so in Adam you live according to the flesh, whereas in Christ you live according to the spirit, Galatians 5, 16 through 18, which is why Jesus said, thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Matthew 7, 20, he was talking about Christians recognizing each other based on the spiritual fruit in our lives, not by our flesh. You will recognize them by their fruits, their spiritual fruit, not by their flesh. It's precisely why Paul said, from now on, therefore we regard no one according to the flesh. 2 Corinthians 5, 16, because even though we still struggle with the flesh, we're not supposed to recognize each other, other Christians, for who they were in Adam but for who they are now, who we are now in Christ. We are new creations. It's a paradox, really, that's hard to grasp, but an important one to understand, because, again, we tend to think of ourselves as people who missed the mark, who fell short of God's ideal, and, of course, we did. But because of that, we think Jesus had to come and, and sort of make the best of things because we messed everything up. Like given the circumstances, Jesus had to come and patch things up for us. So he made us acceptable to God even though we're tainted. Less than what we could have been. You have to understand, when Jesus gave his life on the cross for you and you accepted that redemption, that gift of salvation, you didn't then become some kind of consolation prize for God. Uh, second place child of God that could have been first place if you'd only not sinned. No. Now, the moment you accepted Jesus Christ into your life, in that moment you became everything that God has planned and created you to be from before the world began. A fully redeemed child of God. His highest ideal. 
You see, he is going to come back and remake this world into what he's always intended it to be. But if you're a Christian, you've already been made new. Okay, he's going to redeem this world. You've already been redeemed. He's going to transform the heavens and the earth, but you have already been transformed. Yes, we're going to be given new bodies because our flesh has been corrupted by sin and suffering. That's why Paul says, let not sin therefore reign in what? Your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Romans 6, 12, because we've not yet received our new heavenly bodies, the ones we're going to receive at the end of this age, which Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 15 and Philippians 3. And so we still struggle with the flesh because our flesh hasn't yet been transformed like the rest of us, but it's going to be. And yet you understand, at the end of this age, you're not getting saved all over again when Jesus returns. That work has been done already once. He's not gonna climb back up on the cross. That work has been done in you to its fullest extent. Your eternal soul has been redeemed. It is a finished work, which means who you really are, who God sees you, your very identity has already been made new. It's a paradox that's hard for us to grasp, and yet it matters that you get this because it will change your entire perspective about your standing before God right now, today. When you realize that the work, the transformation he's going to do in this world has already been done in you, minus your flesh. Which means now, by his spirit inside of you, you can navigate your way through a world still full of sin and suffering as the overcoming, completely restored, victorious, redeemed child of God that he intended for you to be before any of this or any of us existed. You understand, he doesn't see you as a sinner. He sees you as a saint, his perfect bride. Right, when he comes back to right the wrongs in this world, do you understand that doesn't include you? Not if you're in Christ, because that work has already been done. You are right now exactly who he wants you to be. Not a sinner, but a redeemed saint. Now, of course, we're still learning, we're still growing, we're still being discipled. Sanctification is an ongoing process because of the flesh, this side of heaven. We never stop being discipled, being made holy. That never stops while we're here. So I'm not saying we can't improve. Certainly we can and we should. But you're also not a second place prize for God. Even with all the sin and suffering in this world and in your own life, because in spite of your sin and suffering, He has made you new. He's given you already a new identity, the very identity that he planned for you from before the world began. So with all of that, and that's a lot, I know that's a whole sermon right there. That's all really just context for this chapter that we're studying today. So, so that we understand what is not only going to happen to us in the future as we read this, but what has already happened happen to us now for those who are in Christ, okay? So let's pick the story up where we left off last time at Revelation chapter 21. And in order to get the full effect of this part of John's vision, we're gonna read through the entire chapter right up front. I told the first service, you know, I know it's a lot of reading that we do on Sunday mornings, but listen, when these letters were sent to the churches uh, in, the, in the first century, in the early church, they didn't open the letter and go to the fourth chapter and the, the sixth verse and read it and then talk about it for the next three weeks. No, they opened up the letter just like you would with any letter a friend would send you today and they read through the entire letter, right? It, why? Because that's context. It's the story. That's why we read big chunks of scripture at a time, okay? So let's read through the whole chapter together and then we'll go back and unpack this a bit. Uh, Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. 
To the thirsty I will give them from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. For, as the, uh, for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with the 12 gates and at the gates, 12 angels and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, twelve thousand stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass." And I saw no temple in this city, for its temple is the Lord, the God Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory of the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So John sees the first heaven and earth replaced by a new heaven and a new earth. This was a concept, by the way, that was widely understood uh, in ancient literature, both biblical and apocryphal. The third century B.C. Hebrew book of Enoch, chapter 45. The first century B.C. book of Jubilees, chapter 1, verse 29. Uh, the first century A.D. book of 2 Esther, uh, chapter 7, as well as 2 Peter, chapter 3, and of course, uh, Revelation 21 here, along with many of the Old Testament prophets, including Isaiah 65, 17 and 18, Psalm 102, 25 through 27, and the list goes on and on. Those are a few examples of ancient writings, both biblical and extra biblical, that support this idea of heaven and earth being renovated or recreated. And of course, those of you who in construction will understand this, there are a lot of people who argue whether this is a remodeling job by God or new construction. Uh, And yet, interestingly, when God said that he would create the new heaven and earth in Isaiah 65, 17, the ancient uh, word used there uh, for create in that passage is the Hebrew word bara. It means to create out of nothing instead of refashioning existing material, which is consistent really with the character of God and his work of creating throughout the Bible. And as far as there being no more sea, there are folks who believe that this is a reference to the fact that the sea was considered by ancient people to be a place of separation uh, and evil and dread, which is true. Of course, we know it was the source of the satanic beast in Revelation 13.1. It's a place of the dead in Revelation 20.13. There are plenty of other references in scripture that associate the sea with heathen people. And so, Uh, Maybe this is a metaphor for the absence of evil evil in the new heavens and the new earth. We We don't know for certain. Some of those same people believe that the description of this new Jerusalem is simply a metaphor as well. Uh, which I personally take issue with because of the the specificity of the detail uh, um, of the descriptions here. Just look at the specific measurements and architectural details. The city lies four square. It's length the same as its width. He measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. There's no reason to go into that kind of specific detail or measurements, or for that matter, 
the inort, uh, ornate descriptions of all the architecture that we just read, if this is just a metaphor. Further, the description of the New Jerusalem is quite practical in understanding how it would actually work as a habitable uh, city, the dwelling place of God with man, that is again talked about over and over and over again throughout Scripture. It, it seems clear that this New Jerusalem, to me, is to be an actual place where God remains with His people throughout eternity. It's, a, first of all, a massive city. 12,000 stadia, by the way, is roughly 1,500 miles. So it's the distance between Maine and Florida. So, and the city is as wide as it is long, which means 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles, right? That's larger than India, to give you an idea. In fact, the square footage of the whole thing is approximately the size of the moon. And with the height equal to its length and width, just for perspective, uh, let's just say there, there were 100 billion people, uh, humans, to live on the earth throughout its history. We don't know. That's just a guess. Uh, and then say 20%, 20 billion of those were, were Christians, accepted Christ, who will spend eternity with God. Based on these measurements of the New Jerusalem, if 25% of the city was devoted to housing, where we're all going to live, all 20 billion people, and the rest was, you know, parks and streets and other common areas, whatever, just general population areas, right? Every single person, based on these measurements, would have a block or a cube for their dwelling that would be 75 acres on each face of the cube. You know how big that is? We're all going to be ranchers in heaven. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. That symbolizes the unity of the Old Testament saints and the New Testament church. And so it descends from heaven, the description being the epitome of all that is pure and beautiful, a place where God's people will live, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. This is the final step in the restoration of God with man that was lost in Eden. Charles Spurgeon said, I do not think the glory of Eden lay in its grassy walks or in the boughs bending with luscious fruit, but its glory lay in this, that the Lord God walked in the garden in the cool of the day here was Adam's highest privilege, that he had companionship with the Most High. Yet, these last two chapters, as good as it is, right? These last two chapters are revelation. You understand they don't simply restore the first two chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2. They go beyond them to a world that is fully ordered and holy, recreated in which God is fully present with his people all the time completing the story of creation where all things are made new and there will be no more sin, which of course we look forward to. But until then, listen, until that day, we know that sin continues to plague this world, but do you understand because of your position in Christ, it doesn't have to plague you anymore because we no longer belong to this world. As a pastor, you often get to be with people during the very best times in their lives, when they get married, when they dedicate their children, when they're baptized, when they decide to follow Christ. There's nothing better than being able to celebrate the best times in life with people you love the most. And of course, the other side to that is the fact that you're also going to often be with people during the worst times in their lives, when people are going through divorce, people struggling with severe addictions, abuse, failing health death in the family, all manner of tragedies, the list goes on and on. And although as the church we certainly pray, of course, for God to move on behalf of hurting people, we pray for restoration and deliverance and healing and comfort in all these situations, but when people come to see their pastor outside of wanting prayer, it's typically not, uh, for instance, to try and negotiate the terms of their divorce, right? Attorneys do that. Uh, when there's abuse taking place in the home, generally pastors aren't the ones who physically remove the abuser from the home. The police do that. When someone's health is failing, again, outside of prayer, people don't normally seek medical treatment from their pastors because doctors do that. Okay? The reason people go to their pastor during difficult times in their lives is because they're carrying the weight of those burdens and they're looking for support, emotional, maybe sometimes intellectual, but more than anything, spiritual support, hopefully uh, to help alleviate some of the weight 
of those burdens, which can otherwise become unbearable. Sometimes the weight becomes more that we can bear alone, and I'm sure all of you know that, which is why the Apostle Paul instructs us to bear one another's burdens in Galatians 6.2. And so, of course, it's right to come to your pastor or your brother and sister in Christ with those heavy things that we all carry at times in our lives. And certainly there are burdens that we were meant to carry. Paul expresses an almost overwhelming burden for the lost in uh, the five, uh, first five verses of Romans 9, the people who don't know Jesus Christ. We should absolutely be burdened for the lost. We should also be burdened for one another when a fellow brother or sister in Christ is hurting. Right? Speaking of the church, Paul said if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. So there are burdens that we were meant to bear and share with one another. But listen, so much of what we carry around in our lives, we were never meant to carry. God never wanted us to bear the weight and the effects of sin in this world. We just talked about this two weeks ago, and yet we cling so tightly to so many burdens in our lives because we think it's what we deserve. Yeah, but I'm here to tell you, deserve's got nothing to do with it. As sons and daughters, we were chosen before the foundations of the earth in spite of the sin and suffering that he knew would plague this world. We were chosen to become fellow heirs with Christ, according to the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, 17, to be a chosen race, according to the Apostle Peter, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 1 Peter 2, 9. Not someday, now today and so in Christ we've become exactly who we were chosen to be from before the foundations of the earth in fact in his letter to the Gentile Christians in Galatia Paul wrote in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek there's neither slave nor free there's no male or female for you are all one in Christ Jesus and if you are Christ's then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise, Galatians 3, 26 through 29. Keep, keep that in mind here. You're Abra Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Genesis, it says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you, Genesis 17, 7. That's a promise not just to Abraham, to us. He made a promise to Abraham and his offspring that I will be your God and you will be my people. He makes the same promise to Moses in Exodus 6 and again in Exodus 29, 45 and 46 where he added to it that he would dwell among us. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. They shall know that I'm the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. And then he said it again to Moses in Leviticus 26, 11, and 12. To Jeremiah, he said, they shall be my people and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them and I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. Jeremiah 32, 38 through 41. In Jeremiah 31, 33, he said again, I will be their God and they shall be my people. To Ezekiel, he said, my dwelling place shall be with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Ezekiel 37, 27 and 28. To Zechariah, he said, sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord, and many nations shall join themselves to the Lord that day and shall be my people, and I will dwell in your midst, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, Zechariah 2, 10 and 11. And just in case you think this is just Old Testament stuff, just Old Testament promises in 2 Corinthians 6, 16, the Apostle Paul says to the Gentile Christians in Corinth, what agreement? has the temple of God with idols, for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Paul is directly quoting God's Old Testament promise and applying it to you and me today. And then, of course, here in Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, we see that very promise from God 
that has been repeated from Genesis to Revelation fulfilled as John hears a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Can you see from, the, from before the foundations of the earth, before time began as we know it, before sin, or, as a sin entered the world, but then after sin entered the world, and, and then throughout the ages, through all of the sin and suffering of this world, God's promise has remained unchanged because what we've gained in Christ far outweighs anything we lost in Adam. And so our sin... And suffering has not only not stopped God's promise from being fulfilled in us, but he says, I will fulfill my promise to be with you even through the burden of sin and suffering that you continue to experience until my return. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. Because of what he's done for us, even with all of the sin and suffering still in the world, he is still our God and we are still his people, not second class citizens of his kingdom, but the very crown of his creation for all those who are found redeemed in Christ. We are his ideal sons and daughters. And so now, today, with all of the sin and suffering that exists all around us, God's promise is fulfilled in us now Today, because the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death, Romans 8, 2, which means there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1. Do you understand? He's coming back to remake the heavens and the earth. He's not coming back to remake you because in Christ you have already been remade. You are now, right now, God's ultimate ideal, the very person he created you to be, redeemed, restored, free from the bondage of sin, victorious over death because in Christ Jesus you have been made new. Is there work to be done as we continue to deal with our flesh? Of course there is. Sanctification is ongoing this side of heaven. Oswald Chambers said all of God's people are ordinary people who have been made extraordinary by the purpose he has given them. The only, listen, the only hold sin has over you today is that which you give it. And so of course we look forward to the new heavens and the new earth where there will be no more sin there will also be no more suffering, praise Jesus. No more suffering. Until then, suffering in its various forms is here to stay, even for those who have been made new in Christ. King David, arguably one of the most successful leaders in the history of the world, certainly in biblical history, once wrote these now famous words. He said, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed and shield, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Psalm 139, 7 through 12. In other words, no matter where you go, no matter what happens to you, no matter what this world may ever do to you, if you're a child of God, then I am always, always, always with you. It's the very same promise God made to us over and over again throughout history. And of course, the reason that passage of Scripture gives us so much comfort is not because life is always good. Right? If life was always good, then we wouldn't need that passage of Scripture. The reason those verses are so meaningful to us is because sometimes life is anything but good. In fact, I'm sure everyone here knows all too well that suffering in one form or another is an inevitable part of living. The truth is there's no version of life on this planet that does not involve some form of suffering at points along the way. And although we often have no control over whether or not we experience suffering, we always have control over how we respond to that suffering. And I believe the greatest single determining factor in how we respond to suffering is the degree to which we understand the purpose of that suffering to begin with. Uh, there are countless studies that show the correlation between a worker's productivity and the degree to which they feel a sense of purpose in that work. In other words, the more purpose a worker is able to identify in his work, the more productive he will be in that work. The Harvard Business Review reported that nine out of 10 people say they're willing to earn less money to do more meaningful work. 
Okay, it's been proven time and again. People are far more likely to work productively and purposefully when they understand what it is they're working for, right? If, if, you, uh, if you tell your child to do something just because I said so, you ever used that line before? Uh, that child may do what you've told him or her to do simply out of obedience, which is good. But look, when you take the time to explain the reason that work is important, they still may not like it, but when they understand why it matters, they will do what you've told them to do with a sense of purpose. Right? It's exactly the same with suffering, because suffering is something we have to work through, and yet if you cannot see the purpose in that suffering to begin with, then you're far more likely to look for ways to simply escape it than you are to look for ways to work through it. And the problem with that is suffering is meant to be something we work through. It's why God allows it in our lives, not simply to escape it, but to learn from it and to grow in it in order to accomplish his will as we work through it. But you're not likely to do any of that if you don't recognize the purpose of that suffering to begin with. Uh, pastor and author Paul Chappelle once wrote, often we endure trials seeking God's deliverance from them. Suffering is painful for us to endure or to see those we love endure while our instinct is to flee from trials. Remember that even in the midst of suffering, God's will is being done. So think of it this way. God created you for this moment in history. God put you on this earth right now for a reason, for a great purpose, in fact, to be exactly who you are right now, which means there's something for you to do right now. And listen, it can't wait. If it could, he would have put you here at some other time, but he didn't. He put you here now for a great purpose, and everything that he brings to bear in your life, including your suffering, is meant to further that purpose in your life. And so first of all, we'd all best get on with whatever that purpose is, because in light of eternity, his will being done on this earth is the only thing we'll ever do that will last. And secondly, we cannot do what he's called us to do in this life without suffering at points along the way. Listen now, because I know this isn't what you want to hear, but it's the truth. You cannot accomplish God's will for your life on this earth without suffering. You cannot accomplish God's will for your life on this earth without suffering. You name me one person in Scripture who did. You can't, because there aren't any. Suffering is a part of the deal. As unpleasant, as hopeless, and unending as it can seem at times in your life, suffering is a necessary component to accomplishing His purpose in your life. And I'm telling you, once you begin to recognize God's purpose in your suffering, which He will reveal to you if you'll let Him, then you will view suffering in a whole new way, a, a paradigm-shattering way, a way that will dramatically change you forever. Because no longer are you just trying to get past suffering, now you're trying to get the most out of it. Which seems counterintuitive for most people, but it's a part of the paradox we talked about earlier because of who we are now in Christ, because we have been made new. Suffering is no longer a hopeless torment, it is a useful tool for the people of God to accomplish His purpose in this world. Just read through the scriptures. You'll find that those who have accomplished the most for the cause of Christ in this world are those who have suffered the most at the hands of this world. That's a fact, Jack. I call it the, the rubber band effect. You take a rubber band and pull it back, and the further you stretch it, the more tension, the further you stretch the rubber band, the farther it goes when you let it go. Those who have accomplished the most for the cause of Christ in this world are those who have suffered the most at the hands of this world. You know who the ultimate example of that is? Jesus, right? And if Jesus couldn't accomplish all that he'd been sent here to do without suffering, then why in the world would we expect it to be any different for us? Suffering is a part of the calling of every Christian, not to punish us, but to equip us for the mission before us. In fact, nowhere in our lives is our personal testimony to the work of Christ more effective in pointing people to Jesus than in the midst of our deepest suffering? If you'll let it. And of course, one day, one day there'll be no more suffering, and we certainly look forward to that day, but until then, we must learn to embrace whatever God puts in front of us for what it is, a tool for us to learn from and to use to point others back to Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said the deep meaning of the cross of Christ is that there is no suffering on earth that is not borne by God. Okay, sin and suffering are a constant reality in this world. 
And yet because of Jesus Christ, because of what he's done for you, even with all of the sin and suffering still in this world, he's still our God. We're still his people, not second class citizens of his kingdom, but the very crown of his creation for all those who are found redeemed in Christ. We are his ideal sons and daughters. In the future, yeah, but also right now. Because he is going to come back and remake this world into what he's always intended it to be. But if you're a Christian, you've already been made new. He's going to redeem this world. But you've already been redeemed. He's going to transform the heavens and the earth. But you have already been transformed. The truth is, in Christ, you're exactly who he knew you would be, who he wanted you to be, who he created you to be, and exactly what he redeemed you for. You have been made new. And if you'll embrace that truth, well, you'll change the world around you. Let's pray.